Good evening. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Immigration at 5 p.m. today, according to the reporting from the National Journal, the amendments were due for the immigration debate. The number of amendments could be in the hundreds. Uh, there are only 100 senators, and there are lawmakers in both houses looking to amend, but this is in the Senate. There are unusual unusual alliances. For example, Mike Lee of Utah associated with the Tea Party and Jeff Sessions of Alabama. Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, is most associated with the immigration bill in the Senate. The House has an entirely different governance system. Someone who's looked very carefully at immigration joins me now, my colleague and co-host Larry Kudlow of Kudlow Reports. We're going to speak to Bill Whalen. Of the, of the Hoover Institution later in the show about immigration and the White House's approach to immigration. But right now, the debate at Kudlow Reports on CNBC 24 hours ago between the Heritage Foundation and Larry and his guest, Doug Holtz Eakin, was about the cost of immigration reform, the cost to the United States. And the surprise here is that the Heritage Foundation published a study putting a $6.3 trillion price tag on immigration reform. It looks to have been a mistake, this number, and a product of poor preparation. But I'll wait. Larry, a very good evening to you. From the debate yesterday, the $6.3 trillion, you challenged that in terms of scoring, dynamic scoring. What does that mean? Good evening to you, Larry. Well, good evening, John. Um yeah, I mean, the Heritage Foundation is a great shop, and it's done a lot of good things, but this is not one of them. Because, look, if you're going to have, uh, first of all, the illegal immigrants are already here. <laughs> so those costs are already embedded into the estimates. If you're going to have new immigrants coming in, and hopefully in a legal way, I mean, I don't know about the border security aspect of this. I'm just talking about the fiscal aspect. But the fact is, the United States needs more workers. Our labor force has stopped growing. And if that continues, that means we are consigned to a very low growth rate of, uh, you know, maybe 2% GDP. So that's one very important point. Immigrants, uh, people, addition to populations, uh, take a look at Europe, take a look at uh, Russia, take a look at Japan. Their populations are shrinking. We don't want that. More people, more work, more economics, more taxes. All right? You can see the dynamic here. The other part is, I don't know if uh, Heritage priced this out at all, but a, a very important part of this immigration bill is they're going to lift the ceiling on what I call the brainiacs which is to say the uh, high-tech engineers that want to come to America to work in Silicon Valley and, and other places uh, to participate in America's technological revolution. And that itself is, uh, has an economic richness to it. And that, you know, you've got potential Bill Jobs is in there. You've got, uh, you've got Steve Jobs is in there. You've got Bill Gates is in there. You've got new Amazons in there. You've not got new Googles in there. I mean, that has to be a pro-economic growth uh, aspect to this. And the kids who go to college here, they're, part of this bill is going to let them stay. That's going to help the economy. I mean, the whole point is, if you look at the economic benefits to uh, immigration, you're, you, you have to conclude it's going to improve the economic growth of the country, throw off more revenues, and frankly pay for itself, and then some. Dougie holtz who's done some great work on this, uh, believes that over 10 years or so, you might even uh, lower the budget deficit by nearly $3 trillion if you have, let's say, 500,000 immigrants coming in per year. So I think Heritage made a very big mistake on this. I want to add what I I've learned from reporting about Mexico as well, Larry. This part of the conversation is often left out because the presumption is that Mexico is a poor country ripped by crime and violence and drugs, and that the borders must be secure and you must build a fence. There's a new president in Mexico. He comes from PRI, the longtime revolutionary party, Enrique Pina Nieto, but he is a man who wants to reform his economy. He starts, I learn, with the 14th largest economy on the planet. The OECD says so.
and a dominant middle class in Mexico, an energy sector that is in bad repair. Pem, uh, the state-owned energy company has been badly treated for decades, but the new president wants to reform it. I only add this, Larry, because it supports something, and you and I have talked for a long time. We want to be a country where people come for education and growth and opportunity. So does Mexico. I think cutting off the United States from those who have the energy to come here from other countries is a way of making sure that the United States is not competitive in the 21st century, is a way of turning the United States into Japan. And I puzzle at those who just want to block people from coming to this country. We have for centuries prospered because we let everybody come here who has the, who has the gumption to get here. Yeah, well, there's, there's always been a big split in the immigration debate between the low-wage immigrants and the high-wage immigrants. And everybody wants the high-wage immigrants. Those are the what I call brainiacs. The low-wage immigrants has been much more controversial, and the uh, problems with the border security is much more controversial. I agree with you, John. Mexico's economy is slightly better. Um, it's not hugely better. If they could privatize Pemex, the oil company, yes. they'd be a lot better off. Uh, I don't believe they're ever going to do that, okay? I think that's, that's just not going to happen. But I, I think that I, I think the big issue here, when you get into the deep, deep politics of this and the antipathy towards immigration reform from the right, there are roughly 11 million undocumented illegals, as you know. We're not going to deport them. Can we just say that? They are not going to be deported. Okay, that debate is over. So therefore, the question is what to do with them here. Can we bring them out of the shadows? Can we make them legal? Can we make them wait 10 years for citizenship? Can we make them wait 14 years to be eligible for Medicare and Social Security? In other words, can we do this? in a rational, cautious, conservative way that will finally end this whole debate. And then we can hopefully have a better border system that will let people come in with you know, visas and come back and forth across the border to get work in, in, in a legal way. I, I think some of my brothers and sisters on the right just do not understand that that battle is won. That battle is won. There will be no deportation, so let's just deal with it. And the second question is, let's get the best bill we have that will enable the United States to be the best country on earth. As you say, we are a city on a hill, as Reagan used to say, and we should have our economic opportunity and innovation. That's the, the bottom line to this thing. The problem I have with the economics of the Heritage Foundation is they don't acknowledge that. By the way, it's an oddity, because in tax policy, you and I have talked about this a million times, if you lower marginal tax rates and you create incentives to work, save, and invest, what happens? Revenues go up. Okay, that's called dynamic analysis. It means that the tax cut improves economic growth, right. which throws off revenues. At least 50% of the tax cut is paid for. Here's the Heritage Foundation, as I say, a wonderful institution, uh, for years arguing for the dynamic scoring of tax cuts <laughs> for economic growth. But when it comes to immigration, they've completely thrown that out the window. It doesn't make a lick of sense, and it's not going to carry the day. It is not going to carry the day. Final question, Larry, on this, because because I want to turn to the economy next. Were you surprised at the pushback at the Heritage Foundation from Cato and other parts of the Republican Party, the Libertarian part? Were you surprised how quickly it came this time? Well, um, I, no, I'm not, because uh, there was a, a lot of warning that this was going to happen and that you've got a lot of people who have essentially led by Doug holtz Eakin, whose study really came out first, but you're quite right, the American Enterprise Institute, Cato, Cato uh, Institute, uh, and others. We've all, I include myself in this as an old Reagan supply cider, for years and years and years, we've, argued for, we've argued for the dynamic scoring of the economy, okay? Whether it's taxes or spending, and now it's immigration. For years we've argued that if America is a magnet for people around the world, more people create more economic growth. That is an economic uh, theoretical fact. And that it is so surprising that Heritage has thrown this out in their analysis. And I just can't help but wonder whether they're not going to amend that. I I'm not here to blast Heritage. I'm here to blast this uh, particular study because I think Heritage does a lot of good uh, promoting conservative ideas. But they, they, they swung at the ball and they whiffed on this one, John. That's the bottom line. Uh, Larry Kudlow of CNBC's Kudlow reports uh, and Kudlow Radio on across the nation on the weekend. 
The winner tonight in First South Carolina, I mention, is Mark Sanford, a political comeback despite the fact that the Republican Party, the apparatus in Washington, turned its back on Mr. Sanford. He is now the comfortable winner. All counties are reporting that he has carried the day, uh, the Democratic disappointment. We'll turn to the economy next. I'm John Batchelor.